Alright, here we go with our last two sections of chapter 9, section 9.4, and uh, which is symmetry, and section 9.7, tessellations, which kind of take into consideration all of the transformations we've done so far. Let's go ahead and start with section 9.4, and for this section, just write down what you need to write down as far as definitions go. I'm not expecting you to draw the pictures, okay? So a figure has line symmetry if it can be mapped onto itself over a single line called the line of symmetry. And mapped onto itself just means that we're going to actually overlay the images so that you can't see that there are more than one image. So we're going to use a single line called the line of symmetry. If we look at the butterfly, this point right here, if I reflect it over this line, ends up over here. So we're talking about that reflection line. So the line of symmetry and the line of reflection are very similar. All right, look at this image right here. Tell me how many lines of symmetry you think it has. All right, did you come up with one? It's got vertical line symmetry right through there. All right, try this one. How many lines of symmetry do you think this has? Okay, think about it. Did you get five? We've got one that goes from each point through its opposite side. Okay, for any regular or any um, polygon like this, it has the same number of lines of symmetry as it does vertices. Okay, so since this was a five-pointed star, it has five lines of symmetry. All right, rotational symmetry. So we're not going to do a line through the middle anymore. We want to see if we can actually turn the object and let it map onto itself. So rotational symmetry is a rotation of 180 degrees or less, all right? So I might be able to rotate it 45 degrees, and it's the exact same picture, okay? In this case, it's not the same picture um, as the original, so here's my original. So 45 degree rotation does not map it onto itself. 90 degree rotation, though, notice that these two images are exactly the same. So this has rotational symmetry at 90 degrees, and again, at 180 degrees. So that meets our criteria. Now, we want to look at these regular polygons or these polygons and see if they are examples of rotational symmetry. So think about it for a second and let's see if we're right. Okay, so this one, if I rotate it mm, until it's upside down, oh, once it gets to be upside down, it is exactly mapped onto itself. So this one does have rotational symmetry at 180 degrees. What about this pentagon here? If I rotate that, and the center of rotation is a little bit off, but if this were a regular pentagon, which our computer didn't quite make it happen, then notice I rotated it from one vertex to the next, and I did end up with the exact same image. So this one has rotational symmetry, and you can figure out what the rotational symmetry is by figuring out, and we did this earlier, I didn't want to do that line. Hang on one second. If I split from the center of rotation all of these angles, so again, five times, if I do 360 divided by five, that's going to give me what the, ring, um, the angle of rotation was. This was a 72 degree rotation, and every multiple of that for rotational symmetry. All right, so what about this trapezoid? Nope. Yeah. Nope. Nope, and we're exactly upside down, so that's my 180 degrees, and it did not end up mapping onto itself at any point in time. So it's not an example of rotational symmetry. Now let's talk about our last type of symmetry, point symmetry. Point symmetry is a little bit more specific, but it's a type of rotational symmetry. It's talking about mapping onto itself at exactly 180 degrees. So what do you think of this stop sign here, this octagon? Does it have point symmetry? Well, if I take this and rotate it exactly upside down, so I'm going to make this green knot go to the bottom, yeah, I'm still the same shape. So this one is an example of point symmetry. Pentagon, what about this guy? We know it has rotational symmetry at 72 degrees, but does it have rotational symmetry at 180? If I rotate it all the way upside down to this green dot on the bottom, notice that I don't. Okay, and you can kind of pay attention to that at the beginning. Notice I have a point at the top and a flat surface at the bottom. They're not going to end up the same if I can go completely upside down. All right, so 
looking at our alphabet and using this font, okay, we want to come up with a list of letters that have rotational symmetry, letters that have point symmetry, letters that have vertical line symmetry, and letters that have horizontal line symmetry. You're more than welcome to repeat letters. There are some letters that have more than one type of symmetry. So go ahead and try for yourself, pause this, and see if you can come up with which letters go in which spots. All right. How'd you do? Okay, remember rotational symmetry has 180 degrees or less but those letters are gonna be the H, the I, the S, N, O, X, and Z. And notice in the alphabet, those are the exact same letters that have just point symmetry. So nothing really rotates less than 180 degrees in the alphabet. Vertical line symmetry, we're talking about going straight up and down. Can I fold it over itself from one side to the other? Is it the same? And this time we have A, H, I, M, O, T, U, V, W, X, and Y. Okay. And then for horizontal line symmetry, can I fold it up to down and map onto itself? We've got only the letters C, D, H, I, O, and X. All right, so we're going to do the second and last section of chapter nine, and it's tessellations. You may or may not have seen what a tessellation is before in math class, but a tessellation is a repeating pattern of shapes that do not have any gaps or overlaps. So they fit all together, kind of like a, a puzzle, hence the reason why we have this puzzle piece here. Now, within tessellations, if you notice, we have reflections, rotations, translations. You can use the same piece. So we have triangles here, we have um, the puzzle piece here. Or if you notice, it doesn't have to be a regular polygon. And this M.C. Escher um, picture, he has been tessellating, if you can see, there's a black horse and a white horse, and his tessellation, so you see this white horse and the black, um, they're being translated through up. And he's really great at this because they don't have any gaps or overlaps within this. But in this course, we're going to specifically, specifically talk about regular ones. We've talked about regular meaning all sides, okay, and all angles being congruent. Just going to notate that. Okay, so they're all equal, they're all congruent, the sides and the angles. So we're going to be talking about only shapes that are going to be the same, and they're going to be congruent regular. So we're only going to talk about like all triangles, um, all pentagons, all octagons. We're not going to mix and match, match ugh, mix and match shapes. So let's figure out how can you tell if a regular polygon can tessellate? Because not all of them are special enough to tessellate. We're going to talk about this formula here that we will revisit later on in the chapter. Let me erase this to make some room. And it's this formula where A equals, and A is actually what the A means or what, when you plug in the numbers. That is one interior angle. Okay? So what we're going to figure out is one interior angle of each shape, where N Okay, is the number of sides. So you do n minus 2 times 180, and then you take that number and divide it by n. It'll give you a number. After you get that number, and that number represents the one interior angle, we need to figure out, does it divide evenly with 360? And the reason being with that is because, remember, we have no gaps, and we have no overlaps. So they have to fit together in a 360-degree circle, each angle. So let's just do one example together first using this formula, and it says, does a regular 18 gone? So, how many sides does an 18 gone have? 18. We're gonna plug that into our formula, where it says n minus two, so 18 minus two times 180, and we're gonna divide that by 18. Okay, so go ahead and do your algebra. When you do that, you should come up with the number of 100. Okay, so that's what each interior angle of an 18 gone equals. So now we have to check the 360 part. So if you do 360 divided by 100, does that divide evenly? What type of number do you get? Do you get a whole number or do you get a decimal? Well, 360 divided by 100 does not give you a whole number. So in this instance, no, a regular 18 gone will not tessellate. Okay, so let's go ahead and look at three other problems and they're below here. We'll do one together, and then I'll have you guys go ahead and do the other two. So it says, do these polygons 
do these regular polygons tessellate? So the first one is a one, two, three, four, five, six. So hopefully you remember a six-sided polygon is a hexagon. We're going to do six minus two times 180 divided by six. Okay. When you do that, you should get 120. Right? Okay. So then when you take the one interior angle, 360 divided by 120 should equal, okay, well, is it a whole number? Yes, okay, so then yes, this one will tessellate. Let's check out, I went ahead and cloned this so we can see, okay, if I move this all around, they all fit perfectly with no gaps because they are all in a circle here, that 360 part. Okay, so let's go ahead, you pause it and do the next two here. See if this triangle and this pentagon, what you get for that. All right, so the triangle is a yes, okay? Because if we move, well, I might have to rotate this a little bit just to let it fit. Oops, okay, there's that one. And then we move this around, and I could clone more. As you see, there are not going to be any gaps there. I have that perfect. And then the pentagon is actually a no. So let's check that one out. Okay, if I would clone and match, okay, that won't fit either way. Let's move that upside down there. Okay, so you see right here, there's this gap that will not form a regular tessellation. Okay, so. Make sure you have this formula memorized because it's, you know, you won't get this on the SOL. It's one interior, and actually we're going to see this later on when we talk more about the interior ends of, of a polygon. All right, so that is the end of Chapter 9. You're done. So if you need to go back and rewatch any 9-1, 9-2, 9-3, and we just did 9-4 and 9-7, go ahead and do that before your next